Hi everybody and welcome to chapter 11 on evolution and its processes. This chapter is a long one and an important one and so we are dividing it into two parts. Part one is going to primarily discuss evidence of evolution and then part two will discuss how evolution works. And just to give you a heads up before we dive in here, all of the checkpoint questions for part one are going to come at the end of the lecture rather than sort of sprinkled throughout. Just um, be aware of that. If you're not seeing checkpoint questions, don't be suspicious. They are coming just at the end. So we're going to start by taking a look at this image right here. And I always like to ask students what they think this image is. Some people tell me they think it's leaves or fur or even uh, little pieces of seaweed. But in fact, these are feathers, and these are feathers belonging to a dinosaur. These feathers were found on a dinosaur tail that was fossilized in amber and dating to almost 100 million years ago. Amber is fossilized tree sap, and as you can see, things that are fossilized inside of this amber stone can be visualized clearly. Um, and it was discovered that this was definitely the tail of a dinosaur and not a bird because of the way that the vertebrae were not fused together inside of the tail. And so when this was discovered, it was one of the first cases where you could actually clearly visualize that there is a definitive evolutionary link between ancient dinosaurs and modern birds, and that modern birds are descendants of these ancient dinosaurs. So before we get any deeper into this concept of evolution, let's define what it is we're talking about, because evolution tends to be a very misunderstood concept. Oftentimes people associate evolution with a biologist named Charles Darwin. Um, but Charles Darwin was actually not the first person to recognize that evolution was happening. The concept of evolution was first observed and hypothesized by ancient Greek philosophers over 2,000 years ago. However, Charles Darwin was one of the first people to really figure out how evolution worked and what drove the process, and therefore his definition that he proposed for it has lived on as one of the most popular definitions, and his definition is descent with modification. That's a pretty short and snappy definition, and essentially what it means is that as organisms descend from generation to generation, they are modified. Another really nice definition comes from the prominent American evolutionary biologist Douglas Fiatuma, uh, who defined evolution as change in the properties of groups of organisms over the course of generations, which is essentially the same thing that Darwin was saying, but with a little bit more explanatory language in there. Wikipedia defines evolution as change in the heritable characteristics of biological populations over successive generations. So taking these all together, the definition that we are going to be using in this class for evolution is that evolution is the fact that populations of organisms change over time, becoming genetically different from their ancestors. It is merely a fact that over time the genetics of populations changes, and given enough time, that change can be reflected into something that we would consider evolution of the population. Evolution, uh, contrary to some popular beliefs, is actually something that you can observe with your own eyes. Um, we can see evolution happening around us, and one great example is in the wide variety of breeds of the domestic dog. So all of these organisms here that you see on the screen are dogs, and um, they're different breeds of dogs. But if you take a look at what these breeds looked like long ago compared to what they look like now, we can see that they are actually evolving. There's a great book out there called Dogs of All Nations by W.E. Mason that was published in 1915, so over a hundred years ago when this book was published, and it includes photos of all of the dogs that W.E. Mason could gather and photograph for the purposes of documenting the dog breeds that existed on the planet at that time. So right here we see photos from that book, 
um, dating from over 100 years ago. We see a bull terrier on the left. In the middle, we have a whippet. And on the right, we have a basset hound. Do these photos look like what these breeds look like today? Well, let's take a look. Here's what a bull terrier looks like today. There are some very notable differences between bull terriers of today and bull terriers of over 100 years ago. Um, notably, the angulation of their hind legs is different. They have now an egg-shaped face where their forehead protrudes instead of making a downward slope like they used to have. The shape of their ears is different. Their uh, musculature is different. Their uh, abdomen protrudes. And um, you can't see this difference, but they also now have supernumerary teeth, which are additional teeth um, that are found in the back of the mouth, which never used to be present in this breed. Let's take a look at a modern whippet. Again, we can see differences in the ears, for example. Um, the ratio of the diameter of the chest to the abdomen is different. The level of musculature is different between the two dogs. If we look at a modern basset hound, there are quite a few differences. Um, the length of the ears is different. The uh, size of the limbs is different. Basset hounds actually used to be taller than they are today. Um, and overall, just a healthier looking dog back then, a hundred years ago than, than they are today. And uh, an important point to make is that what we are seeing here from past to present, this is not just normal variation within the breeds. Um, because do any bull terriers look like this anymore? Do any basset hounds look like this anymore? No, these, these little differences that we see from uh, past to present no longer exist in the modern versions of these dogs. Um, so it's not just normal variation. The, the dog breeds are evolving. They are changing to become different from their ancestors, and that's what the def definition of evolution is. While the dog example is uh, kind of a friendly one, there are also much less friendly examples of evolution that have a impact on human um, livelihood. And one of the most prominent is the spread of antibiotic resistance among bacteria. So you may or may not know that over the past few decades, the rates at which pathogenic or disease-causing bacteria are able to resist our best antibiotics has been increasing. The reason why some bacteria are resistant to antibiotics is because they have some sort of genetic mechanism which makes them not susceptible to the drug which would normally kill um, bacteria of that same type. So here we see some classes of antibiotics up here. We've got fluoroquinolones, cephalosporins, aminoglycosides, carbapenems, and polymyxins. And we can see that over time, in some of these classes of antibiotics, there has been a dramatic increase in the percentage of samples that are reportedly resistant to that type of antibiotic. Um, since the year 2000, fluoroquinolones, which are a newer class of antibiotic, have gone from having virtually no reported levels of resistance to up here well over 20% resistant bacteria um, when tried to be treated with fluoroquinolones. And that's really scary. And the reason why that happens is actually because we are using antibiotics on the bacteria in the first place. This is a natural upshot of the fact that we as a um, medical profession are hitting bacteria constantly with these antibiotics. And therefore, the bacteria that survive are the ones that are naturally resistant to the antibiotics and therefore they are the ones that get to go on and live, reproduce, and become more prevalent in the global population of bacteria. It's gotten so bad that there are actually um, strains of bacteria out there of all sorts that have been described as pan-resistant. And um, what pan-resistant means is that they are completely resistant to every antibiotic that is known to man. Um, it means that there is literally no drug 
that can treat these infections. There is no antibiotic that works against them. They have evolved adaptations that make them resistant to every single antibiotic that we know of. But again, the important point here is that there never used to be antibiotic resistant bacteria. And now they exist in great numbers. And this right here is evolution in action. Bacteria are evolving and adapting to the world that they live in, which is a world where they are under threat from antibiotics and therefore they gain resistance to those antibiotics. And fascinatingly enough, we can even observe little micro examples of evolution happening in the human population. There's something unusual about the hands and feet of this child here. And if you count the fingers and toes, you can see that there are actually six fingers and six toes because this child has something called Ellis Van Creveld syndrome. Ellis Van Creveld syndrome doesn't just cause polydactyly, which is an increased number of fingers and toes. It also causes dwarfism um, and sometimes heart defects. In the world at large, the rate of incidence is one in 200,000. So it's a pretty rare disease, it's pretty rare for a baby to be born with this syndrome. However, the incidence of this disease among the old Amish order in Lancaster, Pennsylvania is not one in 200,000, but rather one in 200. And as many as 13% of the members of this Amish population are carriers. So it is literally 1,000 times more common to have Ellis Van Creveld syndrome among this one group of Amish people in Pennsylvania compared to the world at large. Why is that the case? Well, it turns out that all cases of Ellis Van Creveld syndrome can be traced back to one couple that was part of the founding population of this group of Am Amish settlers back in the 1700s. Because within this Amish population, marriage and reproduction has been very insular, meaning that, that Amish people tend to marry other Amish people from their community, the genes for this Ellis Van Creveld syndrome have remained really highly concentrated in the old Amish order, and it has led the disease to become more prominent because one of the only founders of this population had it, passed it down to their children, they passed it down to their children, and eventually cousins of various degrees were intermarrying with each other, which allowed this recessive disease um, to actually be expressed in very high numbers. So literally the composition genetically of this population has been transformed and this population has evolved to have a relatively high rate of six-fingered, six-toed people um, because of evolution acting on this very small group of humans. So I hope through these handful of examples you can see that evolution is something that we can observe with our own eyes. Um, we can see that it's happening. And these are just a few examples of the types of evidence that we have for evolution. The rest of this lecture is going to be dedicated to reviewing in detail the different fields of science that supply evidence for evolution. And we are going to specifically focus on five of them. We're going to take a look at evidence of evolution that comes from the field of paleontology. Paleontology you may have heard of before. It is the type of science that examines the fossil record and how it changes and progresses across geological time. We will also look at the related science of biogeography. And biogeography is exactly what it sounds like. Um, geography looks at the land and the space and biogeography examines the distribution of both living and extinct organisms across the globe. We will also look at anatomy. Anatomy examines physical traits across organisms and species and assesses their similarity and difference. Embryology looks at the processes of growth and development in different species, especially during their embryonic stage. And finally, bioinformatics 
which examines similarities and differences in the composition of organisms and species, DNA, and proteins. So these are five of the major fields of science where we get our evidence of evolution. We're going to walk through them one by one and look at some examples of evidence that have been supplied by each of these different fields. We're going to start with paleontology. Fossils are the basis of paleontology. And fossils form because over time, layers of loose sediment build up and are compressed in the crust of the earth. As this happens, each layer contains some amount of organisms that died at the time that the layer was formed. Fossils are actually pretty rare, and the reason why is because usually uh, dead organisms are decomposed or eaten before they can be captured in a compressed layer of sediment. And so that's why we don't see um, as many fossils as there once were living organisms on the planet, because most living organisms were eaten or decomposed before they could ever become fossilized. But when the right conditions take place in an organism's carcass does manage um, to make it through this process, then with a lot of time and with a lot of pressure, the bodies actually become mineralized, where uh, tiny molecules of rock go and replace the parts of the body and this is the formation of the fossil itself. There are many different types of fossils out there. Everything that you see on the screen here is a fossil. So um, one that we may be familiar with if we live in Arizona is this one right here. This is a piece of fossilized tree, also known as petrified wood. We also have the more familiar fossils, which are the bones of dinosaurs that we may have seen portrayed in Jurassic Park, for example, on these dinosaur digs. Things that are fossilized in amber are also considered fossils, captured in ancient tree sap and then um, turned into this mineralized hard stone. And then finally, right here, we also have uh, footprints. These footprints uh, have been fossilized and embedded in um, this slab of stone here. These are the footprints of an uh, ancient ape species. So that's how fossils are formed. But of what value are they to biology and, and what do they tell us about evolution? Well, it turns out that if we look at the evolutionary record of fossils, we can see that there are patterns of traits within certain lineages of organisms that follow the progression of time. And I'm going to give you a few examples of these sorts of lineages and how they make sense. This first lineage starts with an organism called Indohyus. Indohyus, which literally means India's pig, um, was a organism that resembled a small deer or pig-like creature, um, and they were thought to primarily exist on land, terrestrial creatures, but they were interesting because they had heavy limbs and a thickened middle ear bone that looked a bit like a whale's ear bone. Whales and dolphins have specialized ear bones that look unlike the ear bones of any other currently living mammal, and it is thought that these ear bones play a special role in allowing them to hear underwater. So Indohyus dated to 54 million years ago. The fossils that have been found of Indohyus are centered around that particular time period. Ambulocetus is another organism whose fossils date to 52 million years ago, which is Although this is a smaller number, it is more recent in time. It is two million years after the Indohyus fossils were dated. And the name Ambulocetus literally means walking whale. They were called this because they also had these thickened middle ear bones, um, but they also had other features that would have made them well adapted to living in an aquatic environment, unlike Indohyus. For example, these organisms had a pocket of fat in their lower jaw that would have helped transmit sounds to the ear, and the structure of the hind legs would not have done well at supporting weight on land, 
so it is hypothesized that Ambulocetus was primarily aquatic. If we look at this next guy, fossils of Remingtonocetus date to 49 to 43 million years ago. And Remingtonocetus was actually missing an important inner ear structure that allows mammals to balance on land and had adaptations in its pelvis that would have allowed for efficient swimming. So now this organism is even more adapted for an aquatic environment compared to Ambulocetus. Finally, we get to Basilos oh, Basilosaurus, and uh, Basilosaurus fossils date to 41 to 40, or 34 million years ago. So this is the most recent in time of all of the fossils. And Basilosaurus actually um, doesn't even have functional hind limbs at all. It has very tiny and invisible non-functional hind limbs that are sort of characteristic of modern whales, and flipper-shaped front limbs as well as a branch tail like we see in modern whales. So the bottom line here is that we see as we get more recent in time, we are seeing a distinct progression which indicates that modern whales and porpoises actually are descendants of a type of hoofed mammal creature that used to be on land. And that actually makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Because whales and porpoises are some of the only fully aquatic mammals in existence, and it's been a mystery of how these mammals came to be fully aquatic, and the fossil record indicates to us a clear pattern, a clear direction, where land-dwelling mammals developed adaptations that allowed them to become water-dwelling. We can see this in the pattern and the progression of the fossil record. Here's another example of how a pattern in a trait follows the progression of time. In ancient equine species, which are um, the ancient ancestors of modern horses and donkeys, uh, we can see that they actually used to have, instead of having a single hoof, multiple different toes. The fossils indicate that they had uh, four toes instead of a single hoof. Over time, as the millions of years pass, we can see that more recent fossilized equine species have a reduction in the number of their toes until eventually all of the toes fuse into a single hoof that is characteristic of modern day horses. So there's a, a clear directionality, a clear progression to these fossil patterns. What we don't see in the fossil record is something like this. Maybe 55 million years ago you see a single hoof and then suddenly there are four toes and then three toes and then three toes and then back to a single hoof. There's no discernible pattern here. Instead, what we see is directionality. You can see that things are going in a particular direction. There is a reduction in toe number, and that brings us to correlate with modern day horses that we are aware of today. So that is the value of evolution um, evidence from paleontology. We can see clear directions and clear patterns that have emerged over millions of years, which lead us to the modern day. This brings us to the second field of science which provides evidence for evolution, and that is the field of biogeography, which I will remind you examines the distribution of living and extinct species across the globe. To understand the evidence that we get from biogeography, we have to know something about the state of the world's continents over the past several hundred million years. From 355 million years ago up until about 175 million years ago, um, all of the continents were actually squished together in this giant supercontinent called Pangaea. And geologists have been able to track the lines um, that used to connect the continents that we recognize today based upon um, geological evidence such as similar types of um, rocks that are found in each area. For example, we know that the eastern coast of South Africa used to be directly up against the western coast of South America because of the types of rocks that are found in those particular land masses. 
Our understanding of biogeography is based upon knowing that um, the structure of the continents across the globe was quite different several hundred millions of years ago compared to what it looks like today. Between 355 and 175 million years ago, all of the continents that we recognize today were actually mashed together into this supercontinent called Pangaea, which broke up over the course of several millions of years and spread out across the globe into the orientation of land masses that we recognize today. And based upon both geological and paleomagnetic evidence, geologists have been able to reconstruct the appearance of Pangaea from hundreds of millions of years ago and know what the continent looked like back then, as well as what pieces of our modern continents used to compose Pangaea. If you go back and you look at the fossil record dating to uh, more than 175 years ago, somewhere around the time when Pangaea still existed, the distributions of fossilized species from this time period indicate that they had a range that is consistent with this Pangaea formation. So, for example, there is this species of seed fern called Glossopteris, um, which is found in all of the continents that are found in the southern hemisphere, but not the northern hemisphere. There's another species, an early mammal species, called uh, Sinoniathus, which is present in this range across uh, Africa and South America, indicating that these two continents used to be directly adjacent to each other in this landmass called Pangaea. On the other hand, if we look at later years, uh, after the breakup of Pangaea, fossils that date to the more recent uh, geological history indicate that they are isolated on individual continents or countries. So, for example, the fossils of those ancestral whale species that we talked about when we were just discussing paleontology, such as Indohyus and Ambulocetus, those are all found in what are modern-day Pakistan and India, which are directly adjacent to each other. Um, and so we know that related organisms tend to be found together. They tend to cluster together. And it makes sense that all of these different fossils that are related to each other are found in the same area. In addition, another example is that 70% of currently living marsupials are found in Australia, um, and only a limited amount of other types of marsupials are found in other parts of the globe. Fossils of early human ancestors are only found in the African continent. And out of the 2,000 species of fruit flies that exist on the planet, 25% of them live only in the island of Hawaii. So this clustering of more recent species is also evidence to us that these species are related to each other um, and evolved from similar types of species. Next, we're going to move on to talking about evidence of evolution that comes to us from anatomy and embryology. And we're going to talk about these two fields together because they're actually pretty closely related to each other. Anatomy looks at the physical traits of organisms and assesses how they are similar and different. There is a term for body parts that appear similar in construction in separate organisms due to their evolution from a common ancestor, and that is homologous structures. The prefix homo or homo means the same, and so homologous structures are structures that appear the same. And there are many examples of homologous structures that we can see across related organisms. For example, vertebrates, or roughly defined as animals that have a backbone, all share the same basic construction in their limbs. And that is regardless of whether those limbs are used for uh, walking, like a dog, flying, like a bird, or swimming, like a whale. They all have roughly the same number of bones and the same basic arrangement of those bones um, in, in their limbs. So that's interesting. Another great example of a homologous structure comes in the cervical vertebrae of mammals, 
um, which are the vertebrae found in the neck portion of the back. Nearly all uh, mammals, with the exception of sloths and manatees, have exactly seven cervical vertebrae in their neck. What you see on the left is a mouse up close, and it has seven cervical vertebrae. You can count them if you want. Here's C1, here's C7. In the middle, you see the skeleton of a giraffe, which also has seven cervical vertebrae, but those vertebrae are much, much bigger than the seven that are found in the mouse. And then you, as a human, also have seven cervical vertebrae in your neck. So all of these mammals have seven neck vertebrae. They just vary in size. So that's another example of a homologous structure. Flowering plants, also known as angiosperms, all exhibit the same type of flower parts, even though those flowers may be quite different from each other. They all have a ovary that contains the eggs. They have anthers that contain the pollen. They have petals, stems, and sepals. And these are all present because flowering plants are all related to each other, even though they have evolved much different appearances from species to species. Now, another concept that we don't want to get confused with homologous structures is something called analogous structures. Analogous structures are body parts found in different organisms that evolved to serve the same purpose, but they evolved independently of each other. So they may perform the same function for that organism, but they do not come from a common ancestor. Great example of analogous structures are bird wings and insect wings. Both of them are used for flight, but the structure of a bird wing and the structure of an insect wing are quite different from each other. Bird wings are bony and insect wings are not, for example. Um, so Birds have wings and insect, insects have wings, but the reason why they have wings is not because they are both descendant from a recent ancestor that gave them those wings. It's because the wings arose independently as separate adaptations to the same problem, and that problem is the need to fly. This is referred to as convergent evolution. The word converge means to come together, and so convergent evolution refers to the phenomenon of separate species evolving similar structures and adaptations in order to solve the same problem. Here's another example of analogous structures. Um, you're all familiar with the appearance of a cactus belonging to the famous cactaceae or family cactaceae. Um, but some members of this other plant family over here, Euphorbiaceae, have also evolved a barrel shape as well as spines, even though they are not closely related to cactuses. They evolved this adaptation um, that looks a lot like the adaptations that cactuses have, but they do not come from a common ancestor with the cactus, at least not a very recent one. Another type of structure that we can observe when we look at the anatomy of organisms is the vestigial structure. Vestigial structures are unused structures that have no function for an organism, but they are clearly homologous to structures that are found in other organisms. An example of a vestigial structure is wings in flightless birds, which clearly do not function in the same way that wings in flighted birds do, but they are nonetheless homologous to wings in flighted birds. Blind cave fish, which have no eyes, actually have a socket where the eye might be, uh, indicating that they are evolved from an organism that used to have eyes, but now because they have no use for them because they live in very dark cave environments, um, they have lost those eyes, but their eye socket is a vestigial structure that remains. Another vestigial structure can be seen in snakes. Snakes actually have what are called pelvic girdles, a component of a pelvis um, in part of their body. As we know, snakes do not have legs. Um, however, they do have a tiny little pelvis. 
why would they have that pelvis? Uh, it makes no sense, other than for the fact that it is an evolutionary leftover. Snakes are descendant from an organism that used to have legs, uh, and over time they evolved adaptations that caused them to lose their legs and resulted in the remnant of a pelvis being left behind, but the legs are no longer there. Whales and dolphins, although they don't have any hind limbs, they have these internal little hind limb bones where if you look at the skeleton of the whale, um, you can see them, but you cannot see them externally. And that is because whales are descendant from a mammal that used to have four limbs. There are vestigial structures in humans as well. Humans have tail bones, although we don't have a tail. We have ear muscles, uh, although we cannot use them to move our ears in any significant manner. And we also have an appendix. All of these things are descendant from uh, organisms, ancestors of ours, that used to have these features, but now we no longer do because we don't have a need for them. But these little artifacts of those structures remain. One place where it is very common to see vestigial structures is during embryonic development. And this is why we're talking about anatomy and embryology at the same time. In this image right here, we see five animal embryos in similar stages of their development, only one of which is a human. And it's a fun exercise to try to guess which one is a human, um, because people almost never get it right. Um, it's actually the very first one. The others are a mouse, bat, chicken, and alligator, respectively. But we can see that they actually all look kind of similar to each other. They all have four limb buds, which will eventually develop into limbs, segmentation along their back, they all have gill arches, and other features that unify them. So it's very common to see structures that, that may not be present in the full-blown organism, present during embryonic development. Humans have full-blown tails and gill arches as embryos, Horse embryos have five toes during their development, which over time fuse into a single hoof. If that sounds familiar, it's because the ancestors of modern horses used to have multiple toes, but um, today they have a single hoof. But we still see that as an embryo, the horse has multiple toes, and by the time it is born, they become one hoof. Also, as embryos, whales and dolphins have hair. Um, which is pretty incredible when you think about the fact that we never associate them with having hair. However, other mammals do have hair. Land-dwelling mammals have hair, and whales and dolphins are descendant from a land-dwelling mammal that used to have hair. Uh, and so during embryonic development, they have this vestigial structure which disappears by the time they are born. So why does all of this happen? Um, well, the reason why organisms tend to have these similarities in their body parts and their body systems is because they are all controlled by these sets of genes called homeotic genes. Homeotic genes are very important because they develop the uh, major body parts and systems such as the fact that there are limbs and eyes and a heart and a circulatory system. All of these things that contribute to the overall structure of the organism um, and are referred to collectively as the master plan for the body. Now these genes, because they are so important, they are highly conserved, which is another word for saying that they mutate very slowly. They tend not to change, because changes in the master plan can be catastrophic for an organism. Imagine if you have a mutation in the master plan in your genes for the way that your heart is made. That can be lethal. Imagine that you have a mutation in the way that your arms and legs are made. That can also be catastrophic. And so because these master plans, these homeotic genes, mutate very slowly and tend not to change, they are shared widely across different groups of organisms. And instead of these genes changing, instead um, organisms will develop and adapt ways to override them later we can see clearly that humans 
still have in their genes the instructions for making a tail. And we know this because we have a tail as embryos and we retain this tail bone as adults. However, we have evolved a way to override that tail. The instructions for the tail remain, but our genetics says at some point the body needs to start suppressing the formation of that tail and preventing it from being there when an organism is born. This brings us to another concept, which is atavism. Biological atavism is the re-emergence of a trait from an ancestral organism. It is the case that rarely humans can be born with full-blown tails because their tail never disappeared during embryonic development. We know that early in development organisms will exhibit the same master plan because that master plan tends not to change and then later in development there are mechanisms that override the master plan and lead to um, diverse appearances in organisms. But mutations in the override mechanisms can cause the organism to revert to the original master plan and result in things like humans having a tail or uh, this dolphin right here, which has hind limb flippers. This is not normal. Typical dolphins don't have these flippers back here, but it is reverting due to a mutation to an ancestral form and uh, opting to create the master plan, which is four limbs. There are also cases of snakes that have been documented having limbs because, of course, they are descendant from an organism where the master plan says make four limbs, but then their bodies have overridden that mechanism. So last but not least, we are moving on to bioinformatics. Bioinformatics is the science that looks at the similarities and differences in organisms' DNA and proteins. The principles behind bioinformatics are ones that are actually pretty familiar to us because we already have some sense of how organisms that are more closely related to each other have more DNA in common. In fact, the more closely related you are, the more DNA you share. Uh, you share the most DNA with the people in your immediate family. For example, your siblings, your mother and your father have the highest percentage similarity of DNA to you. And then the next most closest individuals would be your grandmother and grandfather, uncles and aunts and cousins. But if we spread out this family tree and, and put more distant branches on it, we could see that the farther you get away from your direct relations, the less DNA you share with these individuals. This is not only true for individual organisms, but it is also true across species. And I'll give you an example. If we look at all of the DNA in the human genome across all 46 of our chromosomes and we compare it to other species, we can see different percentage similarities reflect different degrees of relatedness between these species. Humans have 96% identical DNA with chimpanzees, another type of ape. 88% of human DNA is identical to mouse DNA. 73% is identical to zebrafish, 47% is identical to the fruit fly, and 25% is identical to the rice plant, which is actually pretty incredible when you think that 25% of our DNA is the same as a plant. So you can see that as we get farther away in relatedness, you can, you can tell that these organisms are less similar to humans. These are in order of greatest similarity to least similarity. Now, does this mean that chimpanzees are the ancestors of humans and that humans descended from chimpanzees? Absolutely not. That is not what this means. That would be like saying you are descendant from your cousin. Chimpanzees and humans are very, very distant cousins of each other. But it does not mean that chimpanzees and humans are descended from each other or anything like that. It means that there was a common ancestor millions upon millions of years ago that gave rise to multiple lineages, one of which led to the emergence of the chimpanzee and one of which led to the emergence of the human.
So there's a common misconception out there that, that evolution says that humans are descendant from monkeys. No, that's not what evolution says at all. It actually says that humans and apes, chimpanzees, are very, very distant cousins of each other, which descended from the same common ancestor millions of years ago. Here's another example of evidence that we get from molecular biology. Um, there's this protein called cytochrome C, which is a 105 amino acid protein found in the process of cellular respiration. Here it is right here. Uh, because virtually all organisms perform cellular respiration, cytochrome C can be seen in all organisms, and therefore you can compare the structure of that protein across organisms to get a degree of their relatedness. If you look at the version of cytochrome C that is found in humans and you compare it to that of a chimpanzee, there are zero amino acids that are different between the two. They are completely identical to each other. If you compare it to a rhesus monkey, one amino acid is different, so one little piece of the protein has changed. Compared to a horse, 12 amino acids are different. Compared to a tuna fish, 22 are different. And compared to thale cress, which is a type of plant, 39 are different. So you can see as you get farther away, the level of uh, relatedness and similarity also gets more distant. Out of all of these different types of evidence for evolution, paleontology, biogeography, anatomy, embryology, bioinformatics is the most recent um, and requires the most intense technological capacity. And so as bioinformatics has ramped up, it has been able to reveal evolutionary relationships that were once suspected but never actually confirmed. Previously, uh, before bioinformatics was the case, Biologists classified whales and hoof mammals into two separate groups. Whales belong to a group called Cetaceae, and hoofed mammals belong to a group called Artiodactyla. But once people had the capacity to look at DNA sequences and compare similarities between them, they actually found back in the 1990s that whales and hoofed mammals are closely genetically related to each other. As a result, the two groups have been merged into this supergroup called Cetariodactyla, and this is a confirmation of what we see from the fossil record and what we see from biogeography. It's a confirmation of what the fossils are telling us, which is that whales are a type of mammal that gets its ancestry from a land mammal, and we can tell by looking at the DNA of current land mammals and whales and dolphins that the two are distantly related cousins, but much more closely related than we previously thought them to be just based upon anatomy alone. One really incredible experiment uh, that happened a few years ago was actually able to look at the molecular biology of proteins in a T-Rex bone which was thought to be impossible because of how old the bones were. Um, it was thought that the proteins would have degraded too much, but these scientists were able to achieve it. And they were able to look at six proteins that were recovered from T-Rex collagen, which is a protein that makes up your connective tissue. And what they found is that the sequence of amino acids found in those T-Rex proteins were uh, in five out of six of them completely identical to chickens, but not to amphibians, which was interesting because um, you may think at first glance that the appearance of dinosaurs is more similar to the appearance of amphibians, such as frogs and salamanders. However, this evidence shows that on a genetic level, Dinosaurs are actually more similar and more closely related to chickens, which is another confirmation of things like that fossilized dinosaur tail in amber, which show that birds are indeed descendant from dinosaurs. An examination of the DNA of organisms can also reveal these interesting genes that we call pseudogenes, which we can kind of think about as being like the vestigial structures of DNA. Pseudogenes are non-functional pieces of DNA, which are homologous to functional genes found in other organisms. 
Pseudo means fake or false. So a pseudogene is literally a false gene, but we can tell that its sequence sort of lines up with genes that are functional or true in other organisms. One example is the gene for making this special enzyme called L-glonogamma-lactone uh, oxidase, which you don't have to know that full name, um, but this is a gene that is present in nearly all mammals, and it is involved in the production of vitamin C. You may know that humans do not produce their own vitamin C, and that instead we have to get it in our diets. If we don't get vitamin C in our diets, the result is a disease called scurvy because uh, our bodies cannot produce it by themselves. However, other mammals can. All primates, which includes humans, have a version of this gene, but it has catastrophic mutations in it, which make it non-functional and no longer capable of producing vitamin C but we can tell by looking at the sequence that the sequence is very similar to the version found in other mammals. And so somewhere along the way, somewhere along this lineage, mutations happened that made this gene no longer functional in primates, but that DNA is still in there as an artifact of our ancestors and the genetics that they used to have. So I've thrown a lot of pieces of evidence at you in a short period of time. So we're going to take this slide and we're going to summarize what we have seen so far in this lecture as far as evidence for evolution. We saw that within the fossil record, patterns of traits follow the progression of time. We also saw that the geographical distribution of fossils matches with the rifting of Pangaea if you go back far enough and the geographical distribution of later organisms shows that related organisms tend to be clustered together. From anatomy, we saw that homologous structures are common across related groups of organisms, as well as vestigial structures, um, which are especially common during embryonic development. We saw that related organisms tend to look extremely similar during embryonic development because they have the same body master plan, but we can see cases of atavism, which reveal that the master plan is still there, and sometimes there can be problems with the override mechanisms which lead to the ancestral form coming out. And then finally, we can see DNA and protein sequence data, which show that Indeed, the organisms that we suspect are related based upon the fossil record, biogeography, anatomy, and embryology are indeed related because the DNA definitively tells us that they are cousins of each other. What can possibly explain all of this evidence is the theory of evolution, which I will remind you says that populations of organisms change over time, becoming genetically different from their ancestors. What we get from this, and all of the body of evidence, uh, only some of which we've talked about today, is that all life is related, younger species are descendant from older species, and that over time, organisms accumulate changes and diverge from each other. But all organisms that exist today are cousins of varying degrees of relatedness depending upon when they diverged. Now to finish off this lecture, I do have those checkpoints that I promised you. And when you finish this series of checkpoints, you'll be finished with the first part of the evolution lecture. In the first checkpoint, take a look at this picture right here. There's something unusual about it. This right here is called a supernumerary nipple. Occasionally humans are born with more than two nipples. What is this an example of? And I'll point out that Mammals other than humans often have more than one pair of nipples, and therefore we are descendant from organisms that had more than one pair of nipples. In this checkpoint, I want you to take a look at this model of a mammalian heart on the left and a reptilian heart on the right, and see that they have parallel anatomy with each other. Um, they both have an aorta, they both have a 
uh, pulmonary artery. They both have chambers called atria and chambers called ventricles. So they have this similar structure to them. What is this an example of, this parallel anatomy between these two groups of organisms? What is this an example of? Here we see an image of a hoofed mammal or a pair of hoofed mammal feet. And we can see that these hoofed mammals have an extra little piece of hoof up here, and that is called a dewclaw. Dewclaws can be seen in cats and dogs. They are a claw that is located farther up the wrist of the animal and is thought to be useful in carnivores for um, attacking their prey. However, in hoofed mammals, because hoofed mammals are herbivores, these dew claws serve no function. What is this an example of? And then lastly, in this final checkpoint, I want you to explain to me why it is the case that many organisms appear similar to each other during their embryonic development.